So welcome everyone. Welcome for the last presentation, which is uh, my presentation. Um, <clears throat> Uh, so that was an FPGA. It's uh, it's a hobby project of mine. Um, for the people that uh, do not know, I work uh, for VI Technologies. Um, I'm a CLA, CLED, and uh, a LabVIEW champion. And um, I had a hobby. Oh, let me start at the beginning. Let me see the next uh, next slide. So first, that was an FPGA. What are we talking about? I have a video where. Um, I can display the game. So this is uh, actually uh, running on pure FPGA code. There is no code running on uh, a real-time target. This is uh, only FPGA code and using uh, digital uh, I/O. Um, this is running on a compact, no, sorry, on a MyReal, which has no uh, display capabilities. So I'm generating the uh, Visa signal um, using uh, the digital outputs. Uh, what you see here is uh, a resolution of uh, 1600 times 1200 uh, at 59 hertz uh, frame rate and uh, eight colors. And uh, using uh, special techniques, I can get um, more colors than that or the illusion of more colors. If you look at the VR Technologies logo, uh, it seems like there are more colors, but we are using a technique here that is called dithering, uh, which basically puts um, pixels of different colors next to each other, which from a distance seem like uh, an, another color. The same you can see at the uh, the astronaut in the, in the game, um, which is uh, black and white. There's only two colors uh, that you can see there, but it has the illusion if it has, um, as if it has gray scales uh, 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 colors. So there are four players. Uh, the players are playing using uh, Atari joysticks. I will tell you more about that uh, later. And um, basically, it's it's Tetris. So um, you get a random block. You can rotate it by pressing the joystick button. You can move the block left and right, and you can uh, hard drop it by uh, pressing the joystick up. Uh, the block will fall down, and um, the next block will uh, will appear. Um, you get points for the number of lines you clear. Um, if you clear more lines uh, in one go, then you get more points. Uh, and the game speeds up uh, according to the number of lines uh, you are clearing. Um, yeah, and the game supports four players. Let me see. Yes, so the whole idea um, of this started with uh, a YouTube video that was um, released uh, last year uh, by Ben Eater. And he basically builds a video card using only uh, a breadboard, some ICs, uh, a crystal, and an EEPROM. He uses the EEPROM to store an image, uh, the crystal for um, the clock, and then uh, the whole ICs to generate the uh, VGA signal. And I saw that video and was uh, instantly inspired to uh, do that on FPGA. Um, if you want to see these videos, you can uh, Google Ben Eater, or you can look in the description of this uh, YouTube channel uh, where I posted uh, the, the link. Or, it, or Actually, it are two videos, uh, two parts of it. Uh, so both uh, videos are linked here. And it's very, very interesting. He actually continues and builds uh, a whole computer, a whole CPU on a breadboard. Um, and this is just one module of it. But... Um, after seeing this, uh, I could instantly see how to uh, port this to an uh, to an LabVIEW FPGA. So this is the hardware that I'm uh, that I'm using. Um, you can find everything uh, online. Of course, the MyRio you can get from our favorite uh, hardware vendor. Uh, the Atari joystick and the terminal blocks um, are found in a lot of electronic uh, online stores and only cost a, a few bucks. And the, the terminal blocks make everything uh, a lot easier, uh, e also for debugging. If you start soldering, it's, uh, it's it just makes it harder. Um, the joysticks, so the, the CX40, are is actually uh, are actually five switches. So you have four directions, and you have the button. And if you push the joystick in one direction, you're actually closing uh, a switch. So um, to connect this to a digital input on your MyRio, you can use uh, this uh, um, diagram to uh, to basically, yeah, to basically connect it. And if you notice, there is no additional um, electronics uh, needed. You can directly connect 
each of the um, the joystick pins do the digital inputs, and you have a direct uh, um, uh, input value for all of your five um, uh, directions and button of the of the joystick. So this is um, uh, what it looks like. Um, my uh, colleague Kunteo was uh, nice enough to uh, uh, 3D print us a, a case. So what you can see here are the four joystick connectors on the on the other side, and also here you, here you can see that there is no electronic between it. Um, and on the back side, um, we are using five digital outputs to create the uh, VGA or Visa signal. And it's not visible here, but they also directly connected to the terminal block. There is no um, extra electronics needed. And uh, yeah, we'll see that later. So the first game I built, and uh, that was last year, is uh, a snake on FPJ. It's a snake game. Uh, some of you may have seen this uh, during NI days in uh, in Munich. Uh, I had a demo of, um, where I showcased uh, this game. Again, this is uh, done the same way using uh, the same uh, VGA uh, technique. Um, but the requirements, no, the specifications of uh, this game are a little bit lower. I learned a lot implementing this. Um, and uh, from there out, I was challenged to do uh, the Tetris game. Um, you can get the uh, source code for this game uh, when you visit the VI Technologies website. So um, vitech.nl. Uh, go to the blog and select uh, Snake on FPGA, and you will find uh, a link to GitHub where you can download uh, the, the source code. Um, but this presentation is about uh, Tetris. So first more uh, theory about how to generate uh, a VGA signal. It's actually relatively easy. Um, so as you can see, on the VGA connector, you have um, five wires that will be directly connected to five digital ins of your choice and uh, you need to connect a few pins uh, through your uh, on your ground um, and then you have this uh, horizontal sync and uh, vertical sync line which uh, let me put on the pointer uh, yes so you have this uh, horizontal uh, sync and vertical sync line so what is actually happening is with all uh, CRT TVs and monitors you have uh, a raster line or a scan line so basically um, you are drawing line by line from left to right and uh, once the uh, line is uh, at the last point of the visible uh, area this this uh, rectangle here, the electron beam will start um, going back to the first pixel of the second line. And the time needed needed to make this, make this transition is what you see here. Um, LCD monitors do not uh, theoretically need this, but to uh, have backwards compatibility, they um, expect a signal which is uh, the same for VGA and CRT monitors. Um, so they, they will function. So basically what you need to do is get the timing right and output um, a digital high until the sync pulse uh, needs to be outputted on uh, these wires, uh, then make it low and go high again. And the same for the vertical links. And the timing for these uh, two uh, pulses can be uh, found online, of course. So um, for a uh, SVGA signal 800 by 600 at 60 hertz, which was the uh, display um, display that are generated for uh, for Snake. You have this timing, and what's very good about this, it's um, exactly 40 megahertz. And people that worked with uh, LFU FPGA know that that is the the main clock or the basic clock for um, uh, yeah for the FPGA. Which means if you implement this in a single cycle time loop, every cycle of that loop will be updating one pixel on the screen. And uh, down here you find the exact timings. So uh, for the horizontal line, uh, zero till 800 or 799 will be the visible line. Then you get the front porch, the sync porch. This is the time that uh, the uh, sync pulse should be zero or low. And then you go high, high, high again, and um, a whole line takes 165 uh, single cycles exactly. Uh, so you don't have to look at this uh, this timing. You can just count cycles, which make it uh, very easy to implement uh, displays. Um, the upgrade to Tetris. Um, 
so going to 1600 times 1200, which is four times uh, uh, the resolution, is uh, 162 megahertz. The two is a problem, um, so I just chose uh, 60. That uh, makes the 60 hertz go down to uh, 59 hertz. Um, but uh, I don't think any human will will notice that. And um, LCD monitors will first buffer a whole screen and then update every pixel instantly. So you will not see the scan line or everything. So the, the snake game was, was 800 uh, times 660 hertz. And the Tetris game is 1600 times 1200 uh, at uh, 95 hertz. OK, so now looking at the specification uh, of the MyRio, if I uh, open the manual, and look at the digital I.O., I can see the minimal pulse width is uh, 20 nanoseconds. And if you do the calculation, you will get at a maximum uh, uh, pulse rate at, uh, of f 50 megahertz. But um, as you could see in the video, it still works at 160 megahertz. So the question is why? And I think that an eye guarantees um, signal quality. So if you would watch uh, a pulse, uh, a digital pulse on an oscilloscope, you would see uh, a block signal. Um, but if you do that at 160 megahertz, it will more uh, likely be like a wave. Uh, but luckily, the um, electronics in, in uh, displays and monitors uh, and TVs is uh, very mature, is very well developed, and they handle these kinds of signals uh, very well. So I cannot exactly explain how this um, works, um, but it works. Another thing is the logic level of the digital outputs is 3.3 volts. But if you look at the uh, output level of the VGA signals, it's from 0 to 0 0.7 which means uh, I'm way over the maximum voltage that I theoretically could, uh, that, that I theoretically need to give a, uh, a monitor. But also this is uh, well um, protected with the electronics in the monitor. So I had no problems there. Um, but this also means that I can only make um, eight colors. So if you have the RGB colors, um, red can only be zero or one. So it can be black or red. Uh, and the same is done for green and uh, blue. And you can mix them. So in total, I can make eight colors. Um, so if you look at the um, Mario manual, you will see that uh, the FPGA used in there is the Silinx uh, Z7010, uh, which is um, a CPU and an FPGA built in one. And if you look at the uh, Silinx data sheet, you can see uh, the resources that we have available. So um, here on the right side, you see from, uh, the listing from the compile. We have 4,400 slices and about uh, 60 uh, block RAM. Um, the 60 block RAM is why I wanted to show this, because I use block RAM extensively to draw graphics in uh, on the monitor. Because block RAM will store the graphics, I can index the block RAM and then draw the correct colors uh, wherever they want. And if I see, uh, if I look at this FPGA, I have 2.1 megabits of uh, RAM that I can um, use to draw my graphics. This is actually a relatively uh, small FPGA. The MyRio is uh, out for a few years now. If you have a single board Rio, especially the newer generations and the compact uh, Rios and newer generations, you have easily uh, five to 10 times, uh, if not more, uh, of storage and, and slices you can use. Um, <clears throat> but let's say i want to uh, draw a full scale image uh, in eight colors so i have um, 1600 times 1200 the amount of pixels and then i can have i need uh, three bits to display the r the g and the, the red green and blue then i need uh, 5.7 million uh, bits stored into block RAM. So if I wanted to store one image in block RAM, I cannot do this because my uh, FVJ block RAM is too small. Um, this is very important because this means I need to do a lot of optimizations in my code. We will go to the uh, code in just a moment and I will show you uh, what tricks I used to get it uh, to get it working. Um, but basically the 
application is built up out of three loops. The first loop is the 160 megahertz loop, which is responsible of uh, um, X, uh, of, of generating the colors for uh, four pixels each. No, that's not correct. <clears throat> it is responsible for generating the visa signal. So each iteration, it will uh, update one pixel. Uh, the 40 megahertz loop is responsible to tell the 160 megahertz loop which four colors it should uh, draw. Because this is a 160 megahertz loop, I only have 6.25 uh, nanoseconds to run my code, and you can not compile a lot. Uh, the, the compiler will not like you, and uh, will it will just not compile. So I have a, a helpful loop that's 40 megahertz. I know I need to um, have logic in here that gives me four colors for uh, the next four pixels, uh, which will transfer to the 160 megahertz loop. And then I have a normal while loop, which I am running the uh, the game logic. So it's, it uh, runs for all four players, the, the, the Tetris game logic. OK, so I need to switch now to the uh, virtual machine. So let me see. And share. So if everything went right, you will now see a, a desktop with a project library. Um, can you guys in chat say if everything is all right, team? Yes, OK, everything's all right. So you see the project library. Um, you can see here is uh, my uh, my reel. I don't know what it's doing right now. Yes, my reel. Um, I have the um, 40 megahertz onboard clock, and I created uh, a derivative clock of 160 megahertz, which is yeah, four times the 40 megahertz, of course. Um, if I open the um, uh, main VI, we can see the four uh, VIs that I was just talking about. The first one being the um, uh, Visa's uh, single loop. And this is uh, what we are using to uh, generate the, the pixel. So every iteration of this uh, 160 megahertz loop, I will output one pixel on the monitor. Um, I'm using a technique called pipelining. I'm using a technique called pipelining. Um, and I have a, a, a counter. This is not nothing more than a counter. So it counts uh, the 20, uh, 160 pixels that is needed for one line and outputs we an enable when um, the vertical counter should count. So this, this is used to determine which pixel I'm actually updating. I'm inserting an extra iteration because I need to do four iterations for each one of the 40 megahertz iterations. So I'm, I'm putting one uh, extra in here and then I'm outputting the, uh, the, the pixel. So again, we have the connectors. We have the five uh, digital outputs, red, green, and blue. Um, and I, yes, uh, the horizontal sync and the vertical sync. And I'm using a pixel FIFO to communicate from the 40 megahertz to the 160 megahertz. So this FIFO will receive the four colors that need to be displayed uh, from the 40 megahertz uh, loop. And um, I did some optimization here to get it compiled because again, I only this I all executes in 6.25 nanoseconds. Um, but in the first iteration, I get the three uh, pixels or the three pixel uh, value. Sorry, I get the RGB colors for the pixels I'm updated. So the RGB. Uh, the second iteration, I get second three, etc., cetera, etc. Cetera, and uh, that way, I have four uh, pixels that I displayed on the on the screen. I have to make, make sure that I'm outputting in the visual area. So I have uh, 0 to 15, 15.99 horizontal and 0 to 11.99 vertical. And I'm using this to make absolutely sure that I'm not updating pixels in the uh, time that the, um, uh, the, 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 the um, that the electromagnet or the, 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 the electro cannon is going from the right side of the screen to the left side. Because if you're using a CRT monitor, you will actually damage it because you're now shooting um, electrons where you don't want to have them. And LCD monitors, I find, have a security mechanism where the screen just goes blank. Um, so I put here this, this ant uh, security 
gates to make sure that I'm absolutely not putting any pixels outside of the visible area. And then here I have the sync false. This is uh, the timing uh, that I can get from uh, the timing uh, here. Um, so it's, it's basically every time high, and then when I come in the sync uh, range, I pull it low, and that tells the monitor that I'm outputting 1600 or 1200 at, uh, at 50 hertz. So if you just use this, um, you have a black screen, and uh, if you ask the monitor for information, it will display you uh, that you are uh, creating a 1600 times 1200 uh, signal. So that was the, um, uh, the generating, but now we need to decide um, what color each pixel has. And this is this loop. So let me clear this a little bit up. And let me open this one. <clears throat> so uh, in my present, uh, in, the, in the power sheet, in the PowerPoint sheets, I told you that it's not possible to uh, display a whole image because I simply do not have enough block RAM to store the image. So this means I need to do clever things to um, save block RAM. And uh, one thing that I do is uh, just store little parts of the image that I want to display so I can save space. So if you, for instance, look here, the VI Technologies logo is a, a, a color logo. So every pixel has three bits value, RGB. And I only store uh, enough that I can display uh, this logo. If you look at the astronaut and the text here, these are, um, they are only black and white. So I can store this at one bit and need to do some clever um, uh, wiring to make sure it's it's white or blue or whatever color I want, um, and using these these techniques, I'm saving uh, space because this black area I do not have to save in block ramps because I'm simply not drawing anything here. These um, rectangles that you see down here are actually done programmatically, so I'm not saving anything in block ramp. I'm just um, asking is uh, the pixel that I'm currently updating inside or in range of this rectangle? If yes, then uh, draw the color. Um, and then the, uh, the biggest part, of course, is the game itself, but we will come back to that later. Um, so this is the, the 40 megahertz loop that tells uh, the 160 megahertz loop which four pixels are we updating, um, which means every iteration of this loop, we have to uh, give out four for the RGB values of four pixels. This VI is the same as the two counters we saw in the other loop, but because it's only a 40 megahertz loop, I can uh, put the code um, some more, what's more together. And in this cluster, I'm outputting the, um, uh, the horizontal pixel and the vertical pixel that I'm currently updating. And each of these parallel VIs need to decide for themselves if the pixel that is currently updating is for them and what color um, it should, uh, should have. For instance, if I have uh, the astronaut VI, this is this one, it decides if uh, the astronaut should be drawn. This is the um, position of the astronaut on the screen. So I first check if the pixel that is being drawn is inside this range. If so, I update a counter and read out uh, my block RAM that has the information, that contains the information of uh, the pixels that should be uh, uh, displayed on the screen. So how you do that is you create a block memory in your project. So right click, uh, new memory, and I have here the, the astronaut memory. Um, <clears throat> uh, it has a size, it has a name, uh, what's important is that uh, cycles of read latency is set to one because we are reading this in a single cycle time loop and at default it's uh, set to two. But if I do this, um, it will not work. It will not compile because it needs two cycles to read in the, instead of one. Um, it will ask you to pipeline the output, um, which is not visible in my VI here, but it is there. I can show that uh, in, in just a moment. Um, the data, data type is fixed found because each iteration of this loop, I need to output four uh, pixels. So I output four bits, which is my, uh, and each bit is one pixel that uh, I need to display. Um, the interface are both read because I'm not writing to the, the block RAM, I'm just reading is only uh, a ROM basically. And I have uh, an initial values which contain the data, which contains the data of uh, the astronaut. And to store this data, um, you have to make a, a, a a VI that basically 
outputs the data of uh, the astronaut. I can show you this. So this, uh, let me show. These are my lookup tables that I use for the def for the initial values of all the block memories. Uh, so I have one for the astronaut. If I run this, it uh, basically loads an image, a simple P PNG image, and um, formats it in a way that I can use it to store in uh, the block memory as an initial value. I get extra information here, uh, which you have to provide yourself, so you have to do some programming. Uh, but I load uh, the PNG into memory. I uh, have uh, loops that will make sure that I put four pixels in one fixed point and I output the initial data um, that is then stored into the block RAM. Um, yes. <clears throat> so another um, thing that I've shown was the rectangles, which are, do, which are done uh, programmatically. There's these here, the draw rectangles. Uh, these just check again if the active pixel that is currently being drawn is inside a boundary. If so, then uh, depending on the player, uh, because I'm using this VI, I select the color. So this is red, this is green, blue, and uh, magenta. Uh, and this is going on the output. Um, so then there is uh, additional logic uh, here, which is very easy to explain. Because if you, um, I'm drawing the astronaut here, but the game board is actually overlain and this is, uh, is, is an overlay so the game board um, will always be drawn instead of the uh, astronaut uh, and that's basically the the logic that you can see here okay um, I will come back for the play field because that one is uh, more complicated, but the other parts of the uh, display are all using the same kind of technique. So loading from block RAM is either three color or uh, one color to, to save space. And you can basically uh, define your uh, display how you want. So now we're going back to the main VI. The last loop is the normal game loop. Uh, there goes. Yes. <clears throat> so this is a, a, a state machine. This state machine runs the game for all four players. Um, in this array of clusters, I have four states. So uh, there are four elements. I don't know if you can see here. But there, there are four elements, and each of the player has his own set of uh, of data. And what is happening is. Uh, it will update the state for uh, player one. Then this VI will select player two, and it will update the state for player two. Then player three, player four, player one, two, three, four, one. Um, so this is how I also save space. I have one state machine for all four of the players. Uh, now, if I go to the documentation, I have, uh, let me see, state diagram. So this is the, uh, uh, the state diagram that I'm using, um, every state is one case in my case structure, and you can see the uh, the values that are needed for the transition. So we start the game, and we are waiting for the player to uh, press uh, um, the button on the joystick. So if the joystick button is true, it will initialize the game, which will uh, reset the score, uh, clear the board, etc. Then it will create the first uh, tetronomino, so the, for the first tetris block, and place it on the draw play field. Um, I will come back uh, for the differences between game and draw play field. But the draw play field is basically uh, a part of the block RAM that is reserved, that is drawn uh, on the screen. Then I will update the score, um, so the the score on the display will be zero. Um, check, check of the game is game over, because the game over state is if I create a new tetromino and it is uh, in collision with the stack, so the, the, the blocks that are already placed on the play field, the game is over, it will freeze the game for a few seconds and then get up here where um, uh, it is waiting again for the player to to start the game. But if it's not game over, um, we check the drop timer, which is an internal timer that uh, makes sure the uh, block drops down after uh, after one second when the game starts. But if you uh, start clearing more rows, it will go faster. Um, if the drop timer did not elapse, it will check the joystick for input. If the user is doing nothing, it will check the timer again. It will basically wait here till something happens. Um, now, if the user um, 
does something with the joystick, it will first check if that what the user wants to do uh, is a collision. So for instance, if you're on the left side of the screen and you want to go one uh, block more left, so you basically are on the left border, it will not do that because um, you are in collision with the left border. Um, so it will ignore your inputs and start the drop timer, timer again, etc. But if there is uh, no collision, so coll the collision is false, it will move the tetanomino to the new position, then um, do a copy. Um, okay, I, I need to explain the difference between the game and the draw play field. So the game uh, play field basically only contains the stack, the, um, the blocks that are um, not falling down. And the draw play field contains the stack and the uh, block that is currently uh, being used. Um, <clears throat> so by copying the game to the draw, it basically removes the, draw, the falling block. And um, now I place, so I go here, now I place the um, that nomino on the draw play field which makes it visible again. Then I update the score and et cetera, et cetera. Um, there are two cases, which is basically dropping the block onto the stack, um, which is placing the block, um, yeah, which is placing the block on the stack. So what, what we need to do here is uh, check if we have any full lines, um, remove those lines. Then I added a check for a perfect clear. So if, uh, if you clear the whole board, so there's nothing on it again, uh, you get 20 extra points. Then I copy again the game to the draw play field and uh, create a new Tatromino and etc. So uh, that this is the state machine and the state machine is uh, used here. So if you um, open uh, or uh, see the case selector, you can see all the cases that are visible in the state diagram. Um, and every function is, uh, is, is programmed here. I can maybe explain uh, the block ROM a little bit better for this. So this is how the game is basically uh, built up at the moment. Because an, FV an left view FPGA only supports 1D arrays and not 2D arrays, you basically have a long 1D array where you do all your uh, manipulations on. So the game field is uh, 10 uh, by 20. So it's basically a 1D array from 0 to 199 uh, um, elements and uh, I created a gameplay field uh, block RAM which contains all the four game uh, fields for each uh, of the players so uh, this is player one and from 200 there's player two etc and I created four single draw play fields which are the uh, uh, which is basically a copy of the game play field plus the uh, block that I'm currently uh, using to draw it on screen these are all the possible uh, tetrominos uh, you can use, and um, all are, are built up out of four blocks. So I can store these offsets, uh, these offsets, also in block memory. So if I have this block and I uh, create an origin at zero zero, I can store this block in memory as um, an offset of 10, 11, 12, and 13. So if this block would be located with an origin of zero, so um, here, and I add an offset of 10, the block would be actually visible at 10, 11, 12, and 13. And I can do that for um, all these blocks. This is also how I check collision, because if my origin of this block is at zero, um, it is actually on 10, 11, 12, and 13. So if I wanted to go left, I check um, the first, can I go left? No, because um, from 10 to nine is not uh, not allowed. Um, so I have a collision. I will actually also check if 11 to 10 is possible, 12, et cetera. But because one of the four blocks is uh, um, in collision, the whole movement um, is uh, ignored, or if it, if it was a movement down, it will be, um, uh, um, it will be deployed and a new block will be uh, created. Um, yes. So, um, let me see. Yeah, so, so one thing that I'm using uh, for creating uh, a tetnomino, I need a, a randomizer. 
And what I'm using here is the noise generator, uh, which is uh, uh, a native function from uh, for Left Your FVGA toolkit. So if you're using Left Your FVGA, you can use this. Uh, I'm creating a random number uh, from minus four to three. Uh, I actually only have seven tetrominoes, so uh, this this are eight possible combinations. So I need to ignore one. Um, and I create a random seed by uh, reading out the tick count, which the FVJ is currently on. The tick count is random because remember, we are iterating from player one to player two to player three, and all of them are in a different state. There is actually a, a, a difference in when the users are using their joystick. So this is, um, this is random. And it's, it's, um, <clears throat> so there are Tetris games which give you all blocks in the same amount, so they, they monitor uh, how much, uh, how often you get a, uh, a block type, so you will get all blocks at the same amount. This will not do this. This can do this. It can be. A, it can take a long time before you get uh, the, the favorite long block uh, that that will save you uh, in, in in the game. Um, so. Martin, are there any questions of parts of the code that uh, people want to see or uh, want to go in more detail? detail? Not yet. Um, <clears throat> so what's what's the time? So I think I'm basically done with with my presentation. So um, you can also download uh, the source code for uh, Tetris. It's in the uh, description of the YouTube channel. Um, it's, it's free of use. Uh, you can do whatever you want with it. It should be relatively easy to port this to uh, another um, Rio architecture, so a Comfort Rio or a VXI. What you need is um, at least five digital inputs for the joystick, for at least one joystick, and uh, five digital outputs for the uh, phaser signal. And then you can make this, uh, this, this running again. You can maybe show the joystick um, uh, logic. Let me see. Uh, check all time with the collision. Oh, it's here. Yeah, I combined two states here because the wait state is waiting for uh, a button down and the, the check joystick is waiting for any uh, joystick. And to save resources, I put them in the same uh, uh, case because the, the digital inputs here will be compiled only one time. Um, <clears throat> so again, when I was compiling this, and maybe I could show this. Uh, show district composition zones. I hope it will show it. Yes, it will still show it. Um, if you look at the uh, final utilization, I'm at 100% uh, of, uh, of slices. Um, Slices consist of uh, registers and lookup tables, but if you look at these two resources, I'm only using 35% of the registers and 48% uh, or 85% of the lookup tables. So it's not, um, the, there is still room, but uh, I have difficulties getting this uh, to compile. Um, the block RAMs, um, I'm only using 65%, so I can do uh, much more here. And uh, the DSVs, which are multiplications, uh, I try to minimize from the uh, from the start. So only using seven of the eighty that uh, that I'm having. Um, uh, but because I was having difficulties getting this compiled, I have um, created one VI for all the four joysticks, and. Um, I have a case structure depending on the player who uh, needs to have uh, the input read uh, to select the, the digital uh, I.O. So I have five digital inputs for uh, joystick one. Um, then I, de uh, I have an uh, inverter because it's a pull down, uh, no, a full up resistor. So if nothing happens, the inputs are high. If the joystick is moved, the input that is uh, directly connected to that move uh, is uh, gets set to zero or to false, so I need to invert it. Then I have a debounce uh, function. Um, yeah, and then depending on the input, I will uh, output it. And then the next input that I need to have is a none. So if I do uh, a direction on the joystick, 
The next input this uh, VI wants to have is a none. So you have to release the joystick and get it back to a neutral state before you can do the next input. This gives you uh, extreme precision when controlling the blocks because if you do one time left, the block will go one block left and not more than that. I have to release the joystick or um, yeah, release the joystick and then I could can do the next one. And that that works uh, that works very well. Um, I'm still having troubles with the uh, debounds uh, values. Uh, as you can see, I am waiting for uh, 20,000 uh, ticks. So this is, a, this is a single cycle time loop at 40 megahertz. Um, so this is 20,000 times 25 nanoseconds, which is still too fast. I think I need to um, basically add a zero here, add a zero in the timeout of this loop. And then uh, we will not have any debounce issues in the in the choices again, and um, yeah, we will be uh, displaying this um, on the next NI days, NI weeks, whatever will be uh, next, uh, uh, depending on the current situation. Um, but uh, if you see this, please come to us, uh, play. We will have an amazing prize for the uh, um, yeah for the for the people that will get the highest score. And um, I think I'm at the end of my presentation. Are there uh, any questions? Um, I see one question. So you already programmed Snake and Tetris. Do you have concrete ideas about which games to program next? Yeah, so I want to um, always uh, increase the stakes. I'm working on one project, which I'm not ready to announce yet. But I already uh, ordered uh, uh, light guns. Uh, so the the the, the NAS if you know the NAS game uh, the 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 duck hunt uh, gun, you can actually not use the guns that were um, delivered um, with uh, the, the 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 Nintendo Entertainment System because it compensates for the CRT scan that the monitors in that time had. Uh, so if you will use the, the light gun on the on an LCD, it will actually detect nothing and uh, it will not work. So a light gun, if you press uh, the trigger, it will send a digital pulse, pulse and uh, the screen will go black and there will be a white square. And the gun will actually look for that square. If it detects it, you basically hit your target and you get another signal back from the gun. If you miss it, the gun will just not reply and you know you miss. Um, and um, I'm still looking what game exactly to make. Uh, Dog Hunt would be obvious, but uh, there are a lot of uh, other possibilities. Um, but that will be uh, a long time out if even I will ever do it. Um, if you go to the snake uh, blog, so in the description, and if you go to the VR Technologies website, um, go to the blog and then snake on FVGA, you will find the VIs that are needed uh, for just generating an 800 by 600 signal, and you can concentrate on the logic for whatever you want to display. Um, I'm also looking into a, a library where you can visualize uh, the voltage measured on an analog input, for instance, or monitor the digital outputs. So you can use uh, this library to in your in your real time in your in your, in your projects to debug the FPGA without uh, influencing the RT or setting up uh, a data stream or whatever. So you only need at least uh, three digital outputs: so the horizontal sync, the vertical sync, and uh, one pixel color, and you can wire it on the connector to either be it black and white or black and red or whatever you want. Uh, and then you can display the uh, actual voltage that is measured on a digital, uh, on an analog input of the uh, of the FVGA. So you get some kind of, uh, of feedback. Okay, so I think we have come uh, to the end of this. Thank you everyone uh, for um, viewing our first online dot log meeting i hope we will do more of these uh, uh, keep viewing your uh, social media post for uh, more information and um, if you have any questions please mail them to us all the slides all the information that you have seen during these three uh, presentations will be in the description of this uh, YouTube video. It will also be on the uh, .log community thread. Uh, find your own user group. It's it's very important for your own career, for your own understanding for LabVIEW, and it will make your life better because 
every one of us has been struggling with solving some codes and what is hard for you is maybe very easy for somebody else. He can give you one tip, one VI, and you're um, uh, happy again. <laughs> so, uh, yeah. Okay, thank you very much, everyone, and um, maybe see you uh, next time.